Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, this Q&A room with uh, Machine Dreams. It's been a great demo day and uh, the startups have put so much hard work into getting here. It's three months of hard labor and it's paid off. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming and also for joining this Q&A session. Um, you have now joined the specific Q&A section with Machine Dreams. Um, and this is the place where you get to ask all of your questions. Uh, and if you want more information or if you want to know more about their business model or their go-to-market strategy, then this is where you can have the chance to do that. Of course, if you want to tell them how awesome they are and you want to give them compliments on their presentation, that's also uh, this is also the place, the place to do that. Um, just to give you a brief instruction, um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A section. Uh, this is where you put your questions. And I see that there's already some questions coming in. So uh, we'll be answering them uh, shortly. There's also a chat se uh, section, which is right next to the Q&A section. So if you have comments or you wanna just have a chat or you want to, tell them how cool they are and how awesome they are, then that's the where, where you have to do that. So I'll re be repeating that uh, uh, throughout this Q&A session, just so everybody's aware where they have to place their uh, questions. We have approximately uh, 45 minutes. Um, so what we wanted to do is to get you uh, an in a short introduction as to who the founders of Machine Dreams are um, have them answer some questions so that you can start typing your questions in the Q&A section and then we'll start addressing these questions as well. So in the room we have both uh, Toby and Bernadette, uh, the CEO and the CTO of Machine Dreams. Um, Bernadette, as you heard, has a, a wealth of experience in both marketing and advertising, more than 30 years, but she's also a very experienced and well-known keynote speaker. She's a best-selling author, and she's also an, a university lecturer. Toby, the CTO of Machine Dreams, is a, a technical futurist. He's a coder, he's a hacker, and he's an overall digital troublemaker. Uh, they've known each other for more than 15 years, both as friends as uh, colleagues, and uh, they have come together to start uh, Machine Dreams. Um, I've been working with them for three months and it's been an amazing uh, experience. I've learned so much from them. And um, I wanted to ask you in first instance, how did uh, Machine Dreams come to be? Because we all want to know how it started. Thank you, Sass. And thank you everyone for taking time out today to, to be a part of this. So the best way to answer that is actually to reference something you just mentioned, which was uh, the books that I've written. Um, I spent probably a year writing my first book and a year writing my second book. And I was interviewing Australian entrepreneurs, uh, specifically online entrepreneurs. And what I was interested in discovering was what enabled them to succeed and, and what was their, their business model and, and what was, you know, how did they build that? And as I was interviewing amazing entrepreneurs, you know, from Canva and, um, you know, Booktopia and Envato and, you know, Australian sort of unicorns, the, um, the thing that came through really clearly was they had a, a global, scalable, frictionless business that solved a really need, needy problem. And when I thought about setting up a startup, I thought, well, if ever I do, it has to tick those boxes. And uh, when Toby came to me with this software that he'd, he'd uh, produced, and I looked at it and I understood what it was doing and it kind of ticked all those boxes. And I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to start a startup, it has to do that. And that that is the software that I'm, I'm interested in putting my time into. So that's really how Machine Dreams came about. And uh, I've known Toby, as she said, for 15 years. He actually attended one of my courses. I'm a, I'm a copywriter out of many things that I do, but I run courses on how to you know, become a freelance copywriter. And he was one of my students back in the day, in the early 2000s, and we just stayed friends. And whenever I wanted a bit of a, a tech top up, you know, to see what was going on in the future, because Toby is way ahead of the curve compared to most. Um, we'd catch up for a coffee and, and I got to admit, some of it didn't really make sense because he is such a global thinker. But I remember thinking, OK, I'll just let it absorb, you know, osmosis. And then, of course, you know, the world caught up with Toby to some degree with machine learning. And here we are today. 
uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And I, I think that that bond that you have is such a great start of, of the business as well. Um, there's one question that I see coming in already. And, and, and that's something that I wanted to ask you as well. Like, Toby, what enabled you to create the software that started Machine uh, Dreams? Um, and Ian uh, has asked us a similar question. Like, can you tell us more about how what you've actually built and how it works um that's probably a very broad question but if you can start answering that uh that would be great uh, yeah by all means um so I, i've been trying to climb into the computer since i was a little kid and um i remember when i was about seven years old i was reading a book about the um special effects company industrial light and magic that does all the star wars stuff and what i was reading was that they they invented new technology just to be able to tell a story in a particular way. And when they'd done it, they suddenly discovered they could achieve all kinds of things that nobody else could that they hadn't planned for. And that really captured my imagination, the idea of emergence. Obviously, I didn't know the word at the time, but it's this idea of putting powerful tools in the hands of everybody, getting rid of the gatekeepers and seeing what happens with them at scale. So that's my obsession. And as part of that, I, I'm constantly absorbing uh, information technology across a, a lot of different things from VR to blockchain to um, neural interfaces to robotics and my if I have a, a particular talent it's about combining different disciplines and different technologies together and that's really where the uh, machine dream software came from um, I do a lot of work in video games and I started using video game technology to see if I could get past the the problem of machine learning where uh, if you're trying to create software that can detect things in photos and, and videos you need an enormous number of photos to make it work properly you know in the order of millions um, of the things that you're trying to detect and the, the vast majority of people just don't have that amount of images and the, even just scouring the internet you can't find the the number of images you need in, in that kind of quality so what i created was using game engine technology I, i've built a simulator that can generate photorealistic images uh, of assets and defects. So we, we create digital twins, um, very detailed 3D models, and, and the, ultimately they, they get sat in uh, environments that look, you know, the street or the roadside or anything like that, but it's all very photorealistic. The system then will, can pump out any number of millions of images at different angles, different kinds of lighting. Uh, and because we're using uh, game technology, we can actually generate defects. So a really good example is we worked with a, a power company here. They're trying to detect defects in equipment on power poles. And their problem is that, uh, you know, for a particular kind of defect, which is a, a broken tie, a little tiny wire that ties the overhead wires to the equipment, there were only something like half a dozen photos in existence and, and three of them were actually hand-drawn sketches. So it's just not anywhere near enough to train a machine learning model. So we built um, technology that would generate these wires and automatically bend them and break them and apply rust to them and things like that in different ways. So what we end up with is the ability to create uh, an unlimited number of photographs, very high resolution fake photographs or synthetic photographs as we call them. And we can use that to train the machine learning model. The simulator spits out everything we need. We train the model and test it on real photos. And then we can just continue to refine it uh, until we get the highest accuracy possible. That's uh, uh, that's pretty pretty amazing, and I hope Ian that we've answered your initial question. Um, if there is an additional question that you have further to Toby's explanation, please also type it in the Q and A section, and then we can answer uh, as and when uh, we go. Um, also, uh, they have uh, both Machine Dreams has the opportunity to. Uh, for, for them to do a demo so they can explain, depending on what uh, business you are in, uh, exactly how this works uh, and how it would work for you in practice. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if you see the photos that the software creates, it's quite phenomenal in terms of the realism that's been created. And, uh, and until you see that, it's kind of hard to understand how it works. So we're really happy to uh, sit down virtually, of course, and, and, you know, firstly hear your problems because what Toby and I do is one thing, but we need 
subject matter expert in that industry to share with us, you know, where is it that you feel these kinds of, um, this kind of software can be used? And we work together, you know, it's, it's, it's not an isolation thing. Oh, sorry, forgive that word, but you know, you don't work in isolation. So that's, that's what we can do is really sit down with people and, and uh, brainstorm, you know, how this technology can be used. What I, I, and we talked about that, what I was very intrigued by as well is the combination of different skill sets that you have. Um, what do you think about that? How do you, how do you feel about different skill sets working together? Uh, do you guys complement each other and how does that work at, uh, in practice? Well, as you can see, we are quite different and uh, I've never coded in my life. And, uh, uh, and, and so, I think that's it's an interesting question, Sass, in that people often think that to be in a tech company, you have to be a tech person. And I, I actually don't think that's true. Obviously, I like technology. I use technology. I've got an online business. I've been selling online courses for nearly 15 years. So I'm, I'm really well versed in tech, but I'm not a coder and I'm not a mathem mathematical kind of person. And I think I just really like to emphasize that to anyone listening who, who's either in the industry would like to get in or maybe have children or grandkids, you know, to think about how can we get more women, for example, into the tech sector because we have a role, which is to communicate and it's to share the stories and to educate people on how this technology can be used because you can have the best technology in the world, but if no one understands how it can be used, then it kind of falls on deaf ears. And it's a real shame because we see amazing stories just go by the wayside because they just can't get it to the, to the market. And of course, you know, Toby can speak to his, his, his tech side. And it's a really nice balance because, um, you know, people say you shouldn't probably start a tech business without a tech founder. Uh, just because of the sheer cost of building the software, building the website, making everything connect and keeping that software up to date. So for me, I was never going to start a startup if I didn't have a tech founder. What are your thoughts, Toby, on, on the joint combination of skill sets? Yeah, actually, there are two sides to it for me. On the, the personal side, you know, I'm reasonably good at, at a very limited field of things and the rest of life tends to go right over my head. So. I uh, desperately needed Bernadette's business acumen and just general ability to communicate and manage things and, and create a business out of, out of what I've built. Um, but on a technical side, it's also very important. You know, we're working with um, ethics in AI groups and, and particularly women in tech groups because when you're working with AI, it's all kind of black box in the background. And if you don't examine your data and your motives and the people in your team, all the time right from the start you end up with all kinds of bias situations that can do everything from just get your data get your results wrong to introducing and uh, exacerbating inequality throughout the world the perfect example is um, a group in the uk were building a simple thing uh, a detection system for when you put your hand under a, a soap dispenser it spits out soap right and it worked it worked great until a Nigerian tried it and he couldn't get it to work at all until he put a white paper towel on his hand and put it under the sensor because the people building the technology were all white and probably all male too, but they were all white. So they only tested using their own hands and the hands of their friends and the people in their team without thinking about the fact that, you know, this is their world. It's what they currently have around them. But once the technology goes out there, all of a sudden, only white people can get soap. Now, this is a silly example, but when you're talking about data built into government systems, AI looking at analysis of things, facial tracking, all of these kinds of things, you end up with some really terrifying situations. So it's really important to have a diverse team of people and ideas that can uh, ensure that your technology is uh, working the right way and is working for everybody. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I think it's amazing to see as well how you are in the startup world, but you're very much educators as well. And I think it's very much part of what you, uh, what you do and how you bring your message across. Yeah, I, I'm a passionate educator. I've been lecturing at universities since I was 23 and I've been a, a corporate trainer for, for the same amount of time. So I'm a big believer that in order for people to understand the technology, they have to, um, well, they have to be taught in some respects as to how it can be applied. And I'm a kind of a good example because when I came into this business, 
as I said, I'm not a coder. I hadn't experienced, I hadn't had any experience with machine learning or artificial intelligence, but I was curious, you know, and I think that's the driving force. If you're curious about how things are working, then you, you find it. And I had Toby as my teacher, but um, yeah, we do see ourselves as, as with businesses because the people we work with, for example, they may be supply chain managers or they may be, um, you know, in charge of, um, I know my marketing, you know, they're not necessarily AI experts. So we need to be able to democratize in a way the information so everyone can understand it. And in a way, that's the way I see my role with Toby is I'm the synthesizer of information. So, um, you know, I think there's a role for everybody in tech and I think education is part of that. I think, I think we need to get to all the questions, but the, because there's quite a few that have come up. Um, and uh, um, the first one is from uh, Solomon, Victor Solomon, and he's asking, how are the pictures taken and um, who takes them? Um, what is the cost for setup um, and the maintenance and the database of the photos? So I think, Toby, probably you're the best positions to answer this question. Yeah, look, it differs for everybody. In terms of costs, it's uh, it, at the moment we're doing everything fairly bespoke. But the, the long term practice is uh, we build the models with you, the machine learning models that detect your defects, and then we put them up on a SaaS platform. So while we don't require the capture or collection of an enormous amount of photos to make the machine learning, um, what you'll end up with is a, a sort of SaaS subscription where you can upload all of your inspection photos, you know, constantly 24 seven throughout the day. And as they're uploaded, the software will analyze them and send back reports, triaging your image stream to say which ones have defects and that kind of thing. So a good example is one of the power companies we're working with. They take constantly take photos of their asset network via helicopter. Um, in that instance, they are uploading uh, those photos constantly and the, uh, the SaaS platform will then just analyze them as they come in, update reports uh, on the site or put back a, a report into uh, an enterprise asset management system. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think maybe Bernadette to add on like how would it work in practice if a company would uh, approach you guys for a partnership? Sure. So we will basically have a virtual call and we would talk to you about the problems that you're experiencing and, and you might be the person close to those problems or you might have a team of engineers, and analytics, data science people, a whole range of people can get involved and we'd have this meeting and we'd basically look at what is the, the, the low hanging fruit, if you like, about a particular problem that you're experiencing and then we would, for example, ask you to nominate that asset power pole it might be the defect which could be the broken tie or it could be the rusted cross arm and then we'd ask you to provide us as best you can with some photos of both that clean asset and the defective asset and we can work with as few as 10 photos of of those particular assets and even if that defect as um toby said earlier you only had a couple we'd use cad drawings and mo you know catalog models and so we can actually recreate those digital twins and of course that goes into the simulator and it goes from there. So it's kind of a complex product behind the scenes, but in terms of the way we interact with clients, it's a fairly straightforward process of literally just nominating that asset and the defect. Yes, great, sorry. I was just looking at all the questions that have come in and maybe one question that's related to this, like if you work to, with, with a partner, what would, uh, be the charging model like? Well, it's, as Toby said, it's a kind of a bespoke model. And the best way to, uh, for us to be able to quote for you is to have that demo session. And then we spend, you know, 30 to 60 minutes just getting an understanding of what you're trying to do because every, every situation is different. And I know you're probably wanting a cost. Everyone would like, you know, that one line, one liner, the, the best way to give you an accurate quote and we're really happy just is to have that um, that virtual uh, demonstration session and we'll, we'll be able to tell you very quickly what that would cost and what kind of um, results we can probably get for you as well yeah and that ties in with the fact that the technology is applicable across industries as well right toby would you like to Yes, actually, I was just reading a question from uh, from Keith Blackwood, uh, who mentions he's responsible for hospitals. So a, a perfect example there is what we're doing, I guess that the way we talk about it is if you can see it, we can simulate it. 
so we while we've started in power and energy because we've had this incredible opportunity with um startup boot camp the technology is applicable to pretty much any industry and a perfect example is building maintenance we're working with some uh, fortune 500 consulting companies to develop a, an industry model for building maintenance and that includes detecting defects like worn vinyl peeling paint uh, cracked walls those sorts of things and we we can also do vastly different um kinds of things we've got a mining company who detect wear and tear on their conveyor belts by using thermal cameras so we can use exactly the same technology we already have and the simulator can create that uh, those assets and then generate thermal blooms uh, so we can uh, do those kinds of detections there's another company that needs to detect chunks of steel that get stuck in the, the slurry they pour into a rock crusher if the steel goes in their rock crusher can be shut down costing tens of millions of dollars a day so they're using uh, ultraviolet spectroscopy to see through the rock a uh, couple of other examples environmental monitoring uh, monitoring sorry everything from vegetation uh, encroachment to actually detecting and identifying animals through live camera or thermal imaging um, medical imaging so looking for anomalies detecting particular kinds of patterns in x-rays and cat scans even things like microscopy so looking at uh, electronic boards and components or you know cellular data dna pcrs and on the other side of the board um, looking at uh, detecting minerals in ore samples and those kinds of things so there's you know a really wide range of um, use cases we can work with and on our website um, we have a, a great big list of uh, different industries and examples um, that might help uh, pick out what you want so keith uh, we'll definitely reach out to you uh, after this it's probably worth mentioning also uh, Stas and toby that we partner with aws which is amazon web services and they and and we offer an innovation workshop where we can actually work with your team to do the deep dive into the tech because often it's the tech that you know can get a bit complicated but when you're working with people like aws you know they know what's going on and uh, we collaborate to run workshops for organizations so that's a really nice place to start it's kind of a low effort in some respects there's no expectation it's just a chance to get the right people in the room to brainstorm to create some ideas of the problems and and then we go back to you with a with a potential solution so if that's of interest to people we can absolutely organize um, that um, innovation workshop to be conducted with your team yeah, I think it's great because I indeed saw two questions, one from an environmental perspective as well as the hospital one. So I think that that uh, if, if, if people are interested, they can reach out to you guys and you can provide more information or they can book a demo via, uh, via the website. Um, so do leave your details so Toby and uh, Bernadette can uh, get back to you with more detailed uh, information uh, concerning your questions. Um, I also saw a question uh, from Alex, who is asking, uh, who do you think your industry competitors are and what stops others from replicating uh, the technology that you have? Uh, Tobes, would you cover that one? Uh, yeah, so um, there are many uh, machine learning services out there. The major ones that most people know about are you know, IBM, um, Amazon and Google. They provide various services for them, but the vast majority are really aimed at people like myself. Um, you know, someone who can create the software, who can manage all of the complex backends. And we're starting to see some simplified uses of it. But again, what most people we talk to are looking for is not really the machine learning development. It's what happens afterwards. It's once that software is made, how can we use it to analyze our images, improve our inspections, find defects faster, that kind of thing. So we kind of sit somewhere in between those machine learning services and asset management and predictive maintenance systems. As far as I can tell, um, there's only one group we found worldwide that does compete uh, on the concept of ge generating synthetic uh, photographs. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of because we've taken technology ideas uh, and advanced our own concepts from lots of different industries, we're, we're a bit unique in the way that we put things together. And uh, even that competitor um, doesn't quite have the capability that we have in that we've built this uh, generic simulator that can pump out this information and automate the machine learning training. So at the moment, we have a pretty good uh, prime mover advantage. 
Thanks, Toby. Uh, there's another question that have, has come in and it asks about the accuracy of the system. Um, would, you, would you be able to share some information uh, as well on that end? Yes, of course. Um, we're still developing some, some proper benchmarks. We want to put out some papers with a really scientific approach so everyone can use them uh, to, to really judge. But to give you some um, anecdotal evidence, the, the major project we worked on with the PowerPole uh, equipment detection, um, we were detecting 100% accurately um, the finding and identifying the pieces of equipment. So, you know, the, uh, the various kinds of insulators, the ceramic insulators that sit on the poles, the um, cross arms and other bits and pieces that sit up on top of a pole um, uh, out on the street. So when we get to the defect detection is when it gets more interesting. So we found that um, for cracked uh, or you know, porcelain insulators that were missing uh, chunks or, or losing part of their ceramic surface, we had uh, a 96% uh, accurate detection. For um, corrosion on steel cross arms, we had 98% detection. Uh, sorry, so these numbers I'm giving you are the confidence the machine has that it has detected what it thinks it has. We had no false negatives, um, sorry, no false positives, and less than 1% false negatives. And in the detection of the most complex one, which is detecting these tiny little uh, broken wire ties, we had between 86 and 92% um, confidence in detection. In the review of the several hundred photos that we used for testing the results, we missed the detection of one broken tie because there were only about six pixels in the photo that had the broken tie in it. Um, but the rest uh, were all detected. So it, it's really, really high. We're equaling or slightly surpassing the detection by um, human experts who used to be linesmen who work out on these, these pieces of equipment and um, just able to do it at a phenomenally faster rate. So when you look at the the details of uh, the business case that you're offering and the, 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 life, the cycle that is increased and the cost savings that you are offering are, how do you answer people when they say, well, how is this possible? And why isn't it done already? You want me to take that one, Bernadette? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, machine learning has been around for a, a, a while, but in the scheme of, things not really very long it's only starting to mature in the last couple of years but in particular it's the data problem you know there, there's a lot of really powerful machine learning being applied to um, you know sensor information and text and number data but it's the the ability to find these images to create object detection models that has been the major sticking point um, while the machinery for it works to create the models very few people have the images needed. And even if you start searching Google for uh, you know, machine learning image sets, you will find there are a few out there, but not very many, and they don't cover you know, asset maintenance or anything like that. So the, the big advantage is that we now can create data where there is none. Um, and because of that, we can start training these models across the board um, without that kind of uh, an issue. And that, that has really been what's uh, kept it from happening so far. So there's a couple of questions that have also been uh, coming in about uh, investments and even IPOs. Um, what, what, what do you, how do you see the future in that sense? I'm happy to comment on that, Toby. Uh, we are in a fortunate position in that we uh, will one day be seeking investment, but we're not at the moment. What we're really interested in is building up our client pipeline. So if you're listening and you have an interest, that's really uh, the sweet spot that we're looking for is to really put the technology to work. Now, we know there's a lot of problems out there. We know that this can be done in a very cost effective and, and very speedy way. So um, that's not to say in the future we won't be looking for investment. By all means, please get in touch and we can start the conversation because we know it doesn't happen overnight when, when it does happen. So we'd love to talk to you and hear what you're looking for. Um, we're also interested in, in smart money too, you know, people who um, want to have a, an involvement to some degree in, in, in our journey. So an IPO, well, we're not sure about that. It's a very complex thing to do. Uh, and we're just really focused on building the business and seeing how far we can take it because we think it's really exciting technology that can really help a lot of companies in, in a big way.
as I said in the, in the presentation, you know, it's, uh, there's some catastrophic things going on um, and, and things that are actually happening and things that we can prevent from happening as well. So, Tobes, maybe you can talk about the, the asset company or the power company, uh, about the power stations, because these are multi-million dollar problems that this, tech, this technology could fix. So, are you able to reflect on that? Yes, a really good example is um, if you're talking about uh, power generation, um, there are power plants that have these 10 storey high boilers. And I mean, the boiler isn't really a great word to convey what they are. We're talking about essentially a multi storey building full of a fireball. Um, they pump powdered or pulverized um, fuel into it and generate these incredible fireballs. And it's a really finely tuned system. You've got nozzles the size of a, a doorway that pump this stuff out there. And you've got to keep the fireball perfectly aligned because if you don't, it starts to build up um, clinker on the side of the boilers. So you've got this, this sort of a sooty buildup that starts to affect the performance of the system. And it's very, very difficult to detect. And if these kinds of systems go down, or for example, uh, you know, in, in the mining uh, industry, when one of these major conveyors or rock crushers goes down, you're talking about an event that if scheduled happens once a year. You know, when these, these things go offline, you're losing millions and millions of dollars a day, sometimes tens of millions of dollars a day. So when the maintenance is, is normally done, they try and predict when it's going to need to be um, cleaned or, or fixed and shut that down in a controlled fashion. So it's only offline for a very short period of time. When these shutdowns happen unexpectedly, um, you're talking about potentially catastrophic failure um, and an absolute you know, loss of money and, and um, reputation. So on the other hand, you've got a power um, distribution networks, you know, the Bernadette talked in, in our um, presentation about the potential for, for failure and property damage and even loss of life um, when a defect in, in a power pole network goes undetected. So really, that, that's the, the big cost. It's, it's not just the ability to save time and prioritize your everyday maintenance. It's the ability to catch these stupendous potential events long before they happen and make sure that they don't. Thanks, uh, Toby. There is another question that's come in from Alvin. He's asking how photorealistic are your simulated uh, pictures as compared to the actual pictures that are taken from uh, by helicopter, for example? That's a great question. Um, in the first project we did, we, we kind of made sure that our scenes and photos mimicked what they were seeing in a, in a helicopter. And the first run we did was realistic looking, but kind of looked like a game. And it still got really accurate results. Now we've actually upgraded to have completely photorealistic um, imagery. And when I say photorealistic, I mean to the point where you can look at it and not think it's a, a synthetic image at all. So the, the game technology um, has advanced to the point where you, you can generate these things really, really well. You don't see it as much in actual games or, you know, um, videos that you see online because when you're running things in real time, like when someone's playing a game or you're running a video, it takes an enormous amount of power to create that kind of photorealism. We have the advantage that we just have to set it up take a picture of it, change it, take another picture of it. So we get to use the entire power of the computer uh, and, and all of this sort of uh, GPU based um, power to create truly um, indistinguishable photographs. Thank you, uh, Toby. There's another question uh, which uh, we sort of answered uh, back uh, in the beginning of our, uh, our Q&A session as well. But um, Tom is asking about the mining industry. Um, and um, again, it, it would be great if you can go to the Machine Dreams website and we can book the demo. But is there anything that you can add to that? Sorry, you cut out for a moment there. Um, what, what was the, the first Tom, Tom is asking, um, how does the, your uh, Machine Dream software uh, save time and money for, in example, the mining industry? Ah, uh, yes. So. Um, the, like, like we were just talking about, the, the big thing is you, you're going to save cost and time by catching things that are going to knock your production offline early on. But um, a, a better example to give you might be the, the power one. So um, 
if you're talking about tracking, looking for defects, managing equipment, and, and looking at, say, reviewing uh, mining samples, ore samples, that sort of thing, you're talking about people manually reviewing images or people literally looking at a rock face or examining a piece of equipment. The way to think of it is if, you've use, if you're using fixed cameras or, or video or even having um, people walk around and do their inspections with, say, a smartphone, you don't have to spend all of that time doing the inspection on site. You don't have to have experts doing that part of taking the photos or, or making that initial inspection. You just take as many photos as you like and they all get uploaded to the system. The system can then process up to millions of photos an hour. So in the example that we like to use on the power company side, uh, they have a, an enormous asset network, uh, um, including 400,000 power poles. Now they're taking photos of those power poles every day and it takes about nine months to go through capturing all of the photos and having their team of 20 or so expert assessors look through them. Now, really, between one and three percent of the, the millions of photos that they analyze in that period actually have any defects in them or anything that needs to be actioned. So one way to think of, of our software is we triage that stream. So if you've got every source you can possibly imagine sending these photos into a system, we can uh, plow through them in a matter of hours and the software will come back and tell you which ones you actually need to have experts take a look at. So you can go from a, a life cycle of nine months to a couple of days. That's the, the real power of it because the machine doesn't get tired. The machine does it faster. It never gets bored. So its results never change. So you can literally just pour information through it and get those results back very, very quickly. It relates to one of the questions that also come in, like how long does it take for you to set it up and, and actually perform the, the testing? Okay, yeah, again, this is a little bit of a piece of string question. It depends very much on um, the, the company and, and what you want to detect. Um, so some people have these uh, in various kinds of cameras or imagery set up already. In other cases, we help people work out how to manage uh, installing fixed cameras or using drones or other capture solutions. Um, the, the second consideration is how to uh, get to the point where these can all be detected. So we work with domain experts to make sure that we can create the digital twins of your assets and defects, ensuring that they are exactly what they should be. So each customer has their own experts and, and people who normally monitor these kinds of things. So we make sure that we transfer that knowledge into the art that we create and that the simulator is, is creating the correct sort of photos. So that, that part is quite variable. In general, we can do um, a number of, say, a, a two, several assets and, and two to three different defect types in, say, two to four weeks. Um, and then uh, once that's done, the processing of these things happens in a really, really short amount of time. So as soon as the software, the art, sorry, as soon as the digital twins have been created, we turn that into the machine learning software and we work back and forth with your experts to ensure that the software is achieving the level of accuracy that you need. And as soon as that's done, it goes onto the platform and you're talking about nanoseconds to be able to review an image. So again, it, uh, uh, if anyone's interested in that demo, go to the Machine Dreams website and book that 30 minute demo. We have a couple of more minutes left. Um, there's one question that came in from Trevor Townsend. It's, he, he's asking, many companies talk about AI and how it will impact their business, but they seem reluctant to get started. Uh, do you think it's a fear of the unknown or a lack of skills that's holding them back? Well, thank you, Trevor, for that question. I, I think it's probably a bit of both. I think people maybe don't even realise we are surrounded by AI at the moment and it's part of our lives and it's just been absorbed. And so I think it's got this, um, you know, sort of the bogeyman approach, but the reality is it's, uh, it's just about solving a problem. And I think it's through education and so take, you know, talking to Toby, for example, and, and he can really break down, you know, what the, the steps are involved because it's, it's very doable. And I think the sooner you can potentially get that conversation started and socialize it amongst your team, you know, colleagues, the, the sooner you can try a small project, you know, just sample it to some degree and, and, and 
test the waters rather than going in hard. Uh, so that's, that's, I guess, the, the method we take is just to, to try and see how it goes. Tobes, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry, again, my internet is a bit problematic. I, I missed the, the, the second part of that. All I was uh, just commenting on, you know, is AI something people should be fearful of or oh, should yes, it be something sorry. they should embrace? A, all right, let, let me start by saying the sci-fi concept of AI is what people in the industry call general artificial intelligence. And that is the idea of a thinking machine, the, 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 the real, you know, super sci-fi, a machine that has its own ideas and can talk and, and do all of these sorts of things. It doesn't exist. And it is at the moment, at the very least, decades from existing. There is nothing even remotely like it and very few of us are even working on it. What AI really is, is software that can start to remember something and make future decisions based on all of the things that it remembers. And it's very clever, but also very dumb at the same time. You know, we've talked a lot about how we generate all of this image and imagery and all of this data to train the software. And that's literally what we're doing. We're running through this information over and over again and pointing out to the computer, you know, this is a power pole. This is not a power pole. This is a defect. This is not a defect. And you have to do that an enormous amount to make the software work. Once it works, it's just there and it does its thing. There's no going off and, and making its own decisions. There's no uh, connecting to other software or anything like that. It, it just doesn't exist. So while, oh, sorry, and I'll just cover another one because some people will have come across the idea of what's called unsupervised learning. It is possible to create machine learning that can look at information and make up um, its own insights. But that's really just the ability for a computer to see patterns across a vast array of connections that a human might not necessarily pick up. And again, it only happens if you've taught it to do these things. Now, in terms of whether or not you should be afraid of it, yes and no. It's not going to take your jobs. The right people making AI technology are really creating um, machine learning stuff that improves your work. You know, we're working with um, energy providers who have teams of expert linesmen who analyze imagery to detect defects. And we're not looking to replace them in, in most of these cases, especially when you're talking about something as critical as asset infrastructure you always have to have a human involved. You can't just rely on the machine to do it. So what we do instead is we triage that data. We make sure that the experts are spending their time on the thing that they really care about. So, you know, they're enjoying their job more, they're being more useful and they're not wasting their time scrolling through enormous amounts of data that they don't need to see. Where you should be concerned is anyone who's making AI software or machine learning software who isn't interested in ethics and bias. This is the key problem across the board for all of this technology. And it comes back to that, that simple example of, um, you know, a, a black man not being able to get soap from a soap dispenser. And when you're talking about something like facial recognition, um, I'll tell you right now, there's not a single facial recognition system in the world, no matter what anybody tells you that actually works the way it should. They're all biased. They're by in the vast majority, all created by predominantly white males. They have, cultural, um, racial and um, sociological inequalities built into them, not deliberately, but because, especially when we started these technologies, people just don't think about what's not them. You know, it's, it's a little bit like the accessibility problem. A lot of people develop software that people who are vision impaired or hearing impaired or mobility impaired just can't interact with. And it's becoming more and more prevalent and more and more important to ensure that you know, a website can be used by a screen reader. So if you're vision impaired, you can still interact with it. You know, government sites have to have this kind of thing so that those among us who have these difficulties can cope. And it's the same thing and even more important in AI. If you don't analyze these things and constantly question these things from the beginning, if you don't have a truly diverse team, both in terms of, of race and creed and color and ideology, then you're not going to build software that works for everybody. And that's as important for asset detection as it is for facial recognition and everything else. So the key there is AI is not going to take over the world or steal your jobs, but it can be dangerous if people are not really paying attention to the bias that's built into it. That's why we are working very closely with uh, ethics in AI and 
um, women and uh, sub, uh, sorry, minority groups that are often pushed to the edge to make sure that our technology and the way that we build our business um, works for everybody. That's um, extremely interesting. And I understand, Bernadette, that you're going to be speaking on this topic next week, right? I am. It's really timely because uh, there's a series of talks called the Monash Tech Talks, and they're conducted by Monash University. And it brings together a range of professionals and academics and practitioners in AI. And I'm hosting it next week on Wednesday uh, in uh, its virtual event. It's free and it's 12.30, I think. And you can go to our website and just send us an email and I'll, I'll hook you up with the um, the organisers, but it, there's a series of these talks and it's going to be really interesting because it's exactly what uh, Toby is talking about. And, and I think it's part of the education process, you know, start just a, a, attending some things like this and expand that, uh, that, that knowledge that you have. So if you're interested, come along. I think we're running over. Um, should we do one or two more questions and then try and wrap up? I'm happy to stay. And uh, okay. if there's any more questions as well that uh, you have, uh, again, uh, make sure to reach out to Toby and Bernadette and uh, they will be very, very happy to answer them. Um, there's a question that came in from Andre and he's asking if you have a protocol uh, to include um, what you're doing in terms of experimentation on machine learning, the images and how it works. I'll let Toby take that one, if that makes sense to you, Tobes. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by a protocol. Um, information prize. Okay. Um, if you can, uh, perhaps give us a little bit of clarification there. But I think what you're, you're asking um, is sort of looking at the, the, the prior use images and, and historical images and that kind of thing. We do do a lot of work where we experiment back and forth with the way uh, machine learning models work and come out of our simulator. Um, so we find sometimes there are particular kinds of assets, especially when there are things that are very shiny, like a brand new porcelain insulator can, uh, can be quite a shiny thing. And in those cases, we often experiment with combining um, real photos with our synthetic photos to, to balance things out and see if they make a difference. Um, if, if that's the kind of thing you mean, that, that we've been doing quite a lot of that and having great results with it. Uh, thanks, to Toby. Andre, if this answers your questions, let us know. If there's additional questions, then we would obviously like to hear from you. Um, Nicholas is asking, would you consider this a complement to existing inspection systems um, as opposed to a replacement? And do you look for partnerships with camera hardware companies to make installations? Uh, yes and yes. Um, so yeah, it, it's very much, you can, in some ways you can think of our object detection as another sensor in your network. Um, you know, the ultimate idea here is not for our SAS platform to be the be all and end all. It's to feed that data into whatever enterprise systems you've got. Especially when we're talking about large asset networks and companies, you, you're talking about an enormous amount of data, different amounts of software and people. So it's important to be able to feed into those systems and supplement them. Um, in some cases, we're tying in with predictive um, predictive models that are based on known failure states and you know how long an asset tends to live that kind of thing uh, and yes we're very interested in working with capture partners we're talking to a couple of drone and uav companies uh, and a company that drives the the roads in victoria um, scanning the roadside equipment and signage and that kind of thing so those kind of partners we're keen to talk to and we're also interested in talking to engineers um, and asset managers who maybe are very close to a specific problem and uh, they may not even know how this technology can be incorporated, but we just encourage you to get in touch because uh, we see you as our referrers and our referral partners um, and as a collaboration, you know, so that we all, you know, are able to contribute and, and bring this software to, to a business. So if you're in that sector in any capacity, please reach out to us as well. Uh, maybe one final question to, uh, before we wrap up. Uh, Kimberly Winters asking, what conversations are you hoping to start today with investors, more pilots, and potential future partnerships? We partly already answered that, but I think uh, it might be good to uh, clarify and then uh, end the session together. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, firstly, if you're interested at all, and thank you for the question, Kimberly. It, 
just email us, you know, at info at machinedreams.com.au and then we can keep in touch with you and you can let us know what it is you're looking to understand. Um, so that's firstly, please connect with us. Secondly, would be to say we are educators and we're looking to have opportunities to speak on this topic so that we can share what we're doing and also help people understand how this can be used. We're looking for um, companies to incorporate this as a a project into their, their organisation. So we're absolutely looking for partners to, to bring the software to life. And like I said, with investors, we're more than happy and very happy to talk to them. Uh, we're not instantly uh, taking investment, but we are uh, like to build those relationships for the future. Uh, Toby, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, we're, we're keen to talk to, um, uh, as well as customers, potential partners um, uh, on the image capture and um, and sort of generating digital twins, the ability to quickly uh, absorb that information into our system. Um, and, and also anyone who's working with, you know, sort of drones and, and, and those kinds of things. And, and like Bernadette says, the, the people in between who really know the, the, the fields that we're looking at um, and have customers of their own who are um, potential use cases for our software. And you know, at the same time, we're, we're interested to start conversations with investors to see, uh, see where we can go. Um, so once we're ready soon to, to open uh, our round, that we, we've got some, some friendly faces to talk to. And also um, associations, we're very keen to connect with, for example, the Facilities Management Association or the Drone Association, or it might be, um, you know, the Engineers Australia, um, you know, the bodies uh, that represent these, these occupations uh, so that we can, you know, connect with them and, and help their members uh, become upskilled and understand this technology is available. Uh, thank you, everybody who's joined the Q&A session today. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, it's been a fantastic demo day, and I've, I've really very much hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, you can also access these recordings uh, later on if you want to have another look at it. Um, if you want to have a further chat with Bernadette and Toby, or you want to have more information, then make sure to reach out to them. You can, of course, attend the event that um, Bernadette was referring to next week, Wednesday at 12.30. Uh, you can book that demonstration uh, to test the software and to, uh, for Bernadette and Toby to talk you through that. Uh, and if you want to keep in touch with uh, Bernadette and Toby and see what they're uh, going to be bringing you in the future, then make sure to leave your details so they can get in touch. Um, their, their information is also included on the Startup Bootcamp uh, website, so you can also get in touch with them uh, there. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.